Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a special stream with my son. My son Matthias is off special. of school today. Uh, and uh, so we finally get the chance to do something he and I have been wanting to do for a while. This was his suggestion. Um, we've been listening to Nightfall in Middle Earth by Boy and Guardian, their Silmarillion album, uh, in the car. And of course, now, as I've uh, tweeted, we're listening to the Silmarillion too. Uh, so uh, we've gotten up to, we've just been listening to Of the Sindar and Of Men is where we are now, right? So we're, uh, we're not quite to the, uh, uh, we're getting up to the adventures of the Noldor in Middle-earth. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so he wanted to, uh, to, to sit down and, and kind of talk through the, the songs here and uh, do some discussion of these lyrics. And this is actually something that uh, I've had a number of requests for uh, over the last decade or so. Decade? Uh, decade, yeah. This specific album? Yeah, this really? specific album, huh. yeah. yeah. I mean, decade, because it's been a decade since I've been doing Tolkien Professor stuff. Huh. And ever since, you know, the, the, this album has been out for almost 20 years now, actually. Almost 20. Yeah, it's 19 years old. Uh, so no, for it was always in that. Remember, seventeen ninety-eight. 1985. Is it? Yeah. I thought it was ninety-eight. Nineteen eighty-five. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, it's been a while. So, uh, so we're uh, so we're gonna we're gonna discuss. So I thought this was a cool opportunity. We're gonna do a, a special, uh, a, a ca occasional series. I say occasional because I never know quite when we're gonna be able to do it. Uh, but we're uh, uh, mostly because my son's social calendar is so full. It's very hard it's to uh, <laughs> find time <laughs> with my child here. So uh, we're we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be going through listening to the songs and discussing the lyrics uh, of Nightfall in Middle Earth, uh, which is a fascinating project. You know, they're going through not the entire Silmarillion story. Of course, the selection of the Silmarillion story is one of the things that I find very interesting. Um, so as, uh, you know, as many of you know, I'm really interested in looking at different adaptations of Tolkien. And this is, to me, a really fascinating one and something that uh, very few other people have attempted. Uh, this kind of a musical interpretation uh, or adaptation, rather, of the Silmarillion material. So, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, Blind Guardian is a heavy metal group uh, from Germany. Um, so they are not native English speakers, which I think will come into relevance on a couple of occasions uh, in the lyrics, perhaps. But we'll see. Um, anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna go through and we're gonna we're gonna talk about these. So, do you have any thoughts or observations at the beginning here? No, no. Really, but I have a question about. A question? Okay. Uh, what 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 these are? Oh, these these th these are the people who are uh, uh, tuned in on oh, okay. on uh, Twitch right now. That yeah. makes more sense. That's the list of that. Okay. That All right. So let's uh, let's. Uh, that's not what I want. This is what I want. Okay. So let's start the first track on the album. Now, the, one of the interesting things about the album is that um, it has transition songs. Transition songs. Sorry, my, my mouth. It's not what to go for, that <laughs> exactly. Transition songs. Though. It has transition songs, right? So it has it has songs in between almost every song. Uh, there is a, a little transitional piece, which is sometimes musical, sometimes it's just dialogue. Uh, so we have these these transitional and sometimes pieces. Sometimes it's music and dialogue. Sometimes it's music and dialogue uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you know that are designed to keep the. Um, to to, uh, to keep the narrative going, right? Uh, and so the album begins with one of these uh, well, it's, pieces. Well, it's an ex it's extremely long transition song, but a transition. It's the longest. Transition. It's the longest of the transitions uh, uh, elements. Yes. And the strange thing is, it actually starts at the end, and then in song two, it goes back to the beginning. Exactly. That the is. The first what... song is "Wall of Wrath," as the you can see right now. Exactly. It's less loud for them than it is oh, for us. Okay. So the album begins with 30 seconds <clears throat> of combat sounds before we get any music or even any words. The, word, the first word comes about now. 
Well, no, now yeah. we got the creaking got open the of a door <laughs> and the footsteps of somebody. The field is lost. Everything is lost. The black one has fallen from the sky. The towers in ruins lie. The enemy is within. Everywhere. And with him, the light. Soon they will be here. Go now, my lord, while there is time. So this is Sauron, There are places right? below. Yes. And you know them too. I'll release thee. Go. My servant you'll be for all time. And this is Melkor. As you command. Yes. My king. I had a part in everything. Twice I destroyed the light and twice I failed. I left ruin behind me when I returned. But I also carried ruin with me. Someone she, just chatted something. The mistress of her own lust. Okay. So, um, all right. So, it's the very first words of the album, right? So, again, we get combat noises for 30 seconds, right? And, and then, then we get, get the, the creaking of the door, right? And the footsteps. And the, and the footsteps coming in. So, there's... And the, the, inter <laughs> the interesting thing here is that we have no idea what's going on, Right? It's starting telling a story, but not only is it starting to telling the story at the end, but it's starting to tell the story in a way that doesn't actually even, it leaves us wondering about what's happening. Unless you've read The Silmarillion. Even if, you, well, now, if you've read The Silmarillion and you you look at the title of the track, then you know what's going on, yeah. right? You know what The War of Wrath is. Um, because, as you know, The War of Wrath is the battle, the big battle at the end of the at first the age. End. Exactly. So that, as you say is already strange, right? It's already kind of weird yeah. that we begin the album with the end of the story, yeah. right? And the very first words are Sauron saying, all is lost, mm -hmm. right? Everything is lost. Um, so what do we notice right away? What we notice right away is that this story is being told from Melkor's point of view essentially, mm -hmm. right? Melkor and Sauron are the central figures in that first, uh, in that first track. Uh, the War of Wrath, you'd, I mean, because the War of Wrath, that's a victory for the good guys, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, the victory for the good guys, since it's the bad guys talking about it, the victory for the good guys is being characterized as a disaster, right? Everything mm -hmm. is lost. Everything has failed. Uh, the Black One has fallen from the sky. Remember who that is? Yeah, it's um the first winged dragon. Yes, and Caligon the Black, exactly. Uh, the towers and ruins lie because he and Caligon the Black actually falls on the towers of Thangarodrim uh, and crushes them in his mm -hmm. fall. So, uh, so yeah, everything. Uh, it's a complete catastrophe for the bad guys. So uh, we get this kind of reverse look at it from the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's told from the framework of of Melkor. And I, I do think it's not said explicitly, but I do think that that's Sauron talking to him. Yeah. Right. His lieutenant, he calls him my king. And, uh, and also, since he's one of the only ones who escapes in the Lord of the Rings is after and Sauron was one of the main enemies in the Lord of the Rings. It yes. makes sense. Yes, exactly. Sauron. Exactly. And Sauron escapes. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that that's definitely that that's, and then we have Melkor telling, uh, telling Sauron to, you know, to go and to hide himself and mm -hmm. everything. So, um, it's of course conceivable, I suppose that, you know, he's talking to somebody like a Balrog because he tells them to, uh, you know, th there are deep places where you can hide and Melkor says, and you know them too. And of course we know that one of the Balrogs is at least one of the Balrogs is going to be hiding himself deep below the earth. But I think it's, I think it's Sauron. Uh, yeah. it, it, uh, guy sounds too polite. Uh, so I, so I think it's definitely Sauron. Um, and then Morgoth, reflects back on his story, right? Let's look at that last part again. Let's listen to that last part again, Morgoth's final speech. Cuz again, this is this is the speech that he tell that he that he gives which propels us into our first song, right? Mm -hmm. So the war of wrath and the loss of everything for Melkor and for Sauron, that all comes that's that sort of establishes the frame of the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And then his final speech leads us into the first song. As you command, 
My king. Okay, so there goes Sauron. I had a part in everything. Twice I destroyed the light and twice I failed. I left ruin behind me when I returned. But I... Yes. Twice I just... So yeah, I had a part in everything. Right, so he's claiming that he had a part in it, in everything that happened. That he he sees himself as central to the whole story of like creation. Right, Melkor thinks a lot of himself. Well, he is technically a Valar. He is, yes, and the greatest of the Valar. He's well, at least he was the most powerful of all of the Valar. Um, he says. But then he left, and then Mandos was the greatest. Well, Mandos is the king. Yeah, exactly. Um, Mandos is, is 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 held as the Lord. Um, and he is, uh, uh, Tolkien says that Mandos was, or not Mandos, that Manwe was like, uh, was like Melkor's brother, essentially. Mm. They were brothers in the thoughts, in the thought of Iluvatar. So uh, they were, they were like each other and they were sort of peers. Mm. But anyway, he says, twice I destroyed the light and twice I failed. So twice I destroyed the light uh, makes sense because now and he destroyed the light. There two trees. Well, but you see, it's not just that. Actually, this goes back to a story that actually you don't know because we started the Silmarillion uh, a little bit later on, before the trees even were made. Actually, even before the Valar went to Valinor at all, um, when they f after they had first created the world, they created these two huge lamps uh, on these two enormous pillars, and those were the original lights that lit the world and in between they lived on the Isle of Almerin and it was really beautiful and, and it was like a little paradise there underneath the lamps and then Melkor comes and he knocks over the lamps and destroys everything. And that's when they fled to Valinor in the first place. So technically it's twice he twice destroyed the light. <laughs> well, since there were two lamps and two trees, yes. Uh, he technically destroyed four light bearing things, right? Yeah. Or light creating, light generating things. Yes. Um, but he, so he's clearly referring to those two occasions on which he destroyed the light. The interesting thing is that they have him say, twice I destroyed the light and twice I failed. Well, the first time he didn't fail. Well, neither time. He, he succeeded in destroying the light both times, right? So the question yeah. is, what is he claiming to have failed to do? Like, is, is the, the, the implication seems to be... Conquest of the world? Or some, I, yeah, something like that, right? That he, uh, it, he, it, he failed to take control, right? He failed mm -hmm. to, um, uh, he failed to. I'm not even sure exactly what. Um, yeah, and like in one of those parts, like um, he left Gwyn behind them because he had like a really strong army that defeated almost everything. But then, like, also, like. In every battle, like a quarter of his, I mean, was like. Right. Exactly. His he, exactly. He leaves ruin behind him, and of course, remember, he's saying this: "I've left ruin behind me," during the War of Wrath, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, he's currently leaving ruin behind him. He's ruined all of Beleriand, yeah. um, in the wars that have been going on for the last few hundred years before this. Mm -hmm. um, so. Now, he succeeded in leaving ruin behind him when he destroyed the lamps and when he destroyed the trees, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he wrecked stuff, but he still says that he failed. Um, so, yeah, twice I destroyed the light and twice I failed. Let's, let's, let's go back again here. Failed. I left ruin behind me when I returned, but I also carried ruin with me. I also carried ruin with me. She... The mistress of her own lust. That's uh, obviously talking about um the like egg eating thing. Yes, ungoliant. Yeah, the spider. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so uh, I left ruin behind me, but I also brought ruin with me. Uh, so and th so that's a really. So now he says, I brought ruin with me. She, the mistress of her own lust. So he's characterized, he's saying that Ungoliant is like the ruin that he brought with him, right? Mm. Um, and so in a sense, his destruction of the trees was very costly, right? Because he was like coveting the gems of the Noldor and he lost all. The, he didn't gain as much as he hoped to gain. Uh, and he was, he was himself almost destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big deal. Um but uh, 
I left ruin behind me, but I also took ruin with me. Um, this and remember the whole context of this is the War of Wrath. He's reflecting on this as the the armies of the Valar are destroying him. Right, the armies of Valinor are destroying all of his servants mm -hmm. and closing in and about to imprison him again. Right, they're about mm -hmm. to take him captive. So um, he is. In context, he's reflecting on his own ruin, on his own downfall. And he says that he brought ruin with him. Right. And so he so his recollection of Ungoliant is what then launches us into the first song. Right. Mm. And the first song is going to be so we start at the end of the story at the War of Wrath. And then in the first song, we go back to the very beginning uh, of where they pick up the story. Not quite the very beginning. Exactly. It's not the very beginning. It's the very the very beginning of their... So they choose to begin their story in the album. Yeah, like, pretty, it, I think it must be... Like, with Ungolia. It's kind of, like, almost certainly told by Valkal. Right. Because um, right. it was told by the elves, and it would have, like, all the things before right. it. You lean forward, not back. There you go. I would have like all the things before it, like the awakening of the elves. Right, exactly. The, so it, it it's not. And the traveling to Valinor. Right, exactly, exactly. So, the the th again the conclusion that we can draw from the way that the opening of this album is framed and the place where it begins, right? Okay. The question that we can ask ourselves is: so exactly what story are they telling? Because as you say, it's not the story of the whole Silmarillion. Right. And it's clearly not the story of the elves because it doesn't start with any of the elvish things specifically. It's the story of it starts with Melkor's arrival in Middle Earth. The funny thing is some of them are elven things specifically. Oh, yeah. No, the, 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 the elves are going to be involved. Right. We're oh, going to yeah. talk a lot about the elves, yeah. but it doesn't start with, if you see what I mean, an elvish beginning to the mm -hmm. to the story. None of the elvish beginnings. It's not even primarily about the rebellion of the Noldor. We're going to talk a lot about the rebellion of the Noldor here. We'll see that. We'll see, you know, we'll, 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 we'll yeah, get a few fan things. The Noldor is like really late, like the sixth song. <laughs> right. Well, we will get the Noldor song, though. Six, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll see. We'll be talking about the rebellion of the Noldor in songs two and three as well. But the point is that's not... Not, not three. Yeah, Curse of Feanor? Totally. Totally. Three is not no, 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 no. The third song, not oh, the, third the third trans, song. not the third track. One, two, good point. It's the sixth track, t technically, but the third song. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so again, we're, we're going to be talking about the rebellion of the Noldor, but it's not, it doesn't start with the Noldor's perspective. It starts with Melkor returning to Middle Earth. And remember the title of the album, you know, the, the title of the album is Nightfall in Middle Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, even though, of course, you know, uh, Matthias, I remember as you were pointing out. Yeah, I was pointing out that, um, like, in case of literalism, yes. it's technically incorrect. <laughs> right. Because it's Nightfall in Valinor. Exactly. When we're talking about the destruction of the trees, right, we're talking about Nightfall in Valinor, not Nightfall uh -huh. in Middle-earth. So the implication there... But I, then they I, do have a specific song for Nightfall in Valinor. They do have a song for Nightfall uh, in Valinor, which we're going to look at, we should get to today. Hopefully, it's already nine forty-six. I know. I tend to talk a lot, but you know that's the thing. Uh, so anyway, um, even with land and all the random temples. <laughs> that's right. Even without random temples to look at. Yeah, yeah true enough. Uh, so anyway, um, the suggestion, right, is that. It's, so it's obviously not just talking about... No. When it talks about Nightfall, it's not just talking... It's, it's not only talking about the destruction of the trees and the darkening of Valinor, right? Um, and so since the title of the album is Nightfall in Middle-Earth and it begins with Melkor's return to Middle-Earth and bringing darkness to Middle-Earth, mm -hmm. that seems to be drawing the focus drawing the focus there. But again, it's not a, it doesn't begin with Feanor's return to Middle-Earth. No. Or Fanor's decision to return to Middle Earth, right? We get there, we get that at the beginning, but it's not the very beginning. The very beginning is Melkor's uh, fall at the War of Wrath, and then his recollection of coming across the Helcaraxa with Ungoliant. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to "Into the Storm," Into the Storm. which is the first uh, uh, the first full song, and this is their song. Does this have two pages? It uh, no. 
This is, we got this on the one page. Really? Oh, good. Uh, so uh, we're going to listen to Into the Storm. These are the lyrics of Into the Storm, and then we will talk about this. This is the, un- the uh, Melkor and Ungoliant song. I did my part. Now it's your turn. And remember what you've promised, right? That's mm-hmm. again. It's a, it's a pair. It's not exactly word for word, but it's a paraphrase of what she says mm-hmm. uh, in the book. So she is claiming all of the treasure, right? Mm-hmm. And she's saying that she deserves it. She earned it. He promised to give her to pay her uh, for her help in destroying the trees mm-hmm. of Valinor, right? Yeah. Even and, though you. Um... Actually, technically, that's not quite right because he did promise to give her everything except. Well, he didn't. The... He didn't. He didn't exclude it at the beginning, though. He said, uh, "With both hands, shall I give it?" Right. And so, in the book, remember, she says, "You give with one hand only." Right. With the left, show me thy right, because in his right hand, he's holding the Silmarils in his hand. Mm. So she says, you're only giving to me with one hand. You said you would give to me with both hands. Show me thy right. And so he opens up his right hand. So now um, Morgoth is there holding the three Silmarils in his right hand, which is being burned by them, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a foreshadowing of, remember the story about the, with the hand, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. With um, Baron. Yes. Just as Baron is going to be holding the Silmaril in his right hand, which is going to get bit off, which is then going to burn Karkaroth the wolf's belly, mm-hmm. right? So Morgoth is holding the Silmarils in his right hand uh, as he is confronting Ungoliant. And she's wanting to eat him, right? She's wanting to... She's, so she is... Uh, the question is, is Morgoth right-handed or left-handed? I don't know if Hopefully he's a righty or a lefty. Right-handed. <laughs> Hopefully he's right-handed. Well, his right hand is going to be burned. Um, exactly. That's why he's hopefully right-handed. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so anyway, so the, the emphasis... So that, that parallel is really cool. I actually never really thought about that very much. The way in which Morgoth confronting Ungoliant with the Silmarils in his right hand is is an anticipation of, right? Is a parallel uh, to Baron confronting Karkaroth the wolf with the Silmaril in his right hand and Karkaroth actually biting it off, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas the, it makes you kind of wonder what would have happened to Ungoliant had she taken this, had she eaten the Silmarils. I'm thinking she could have handled it. I mean, after all, she just ate the trees, right? And it's not like the mm-hmm. Silmarils are more powerful and more holy than the trees were. Yeah, they're like really exactly the same. Because they hold the exact same light. Yeah, exactly. So if she can eat the trees... If she can eat the trees, you'd think she could eat... The the Silmarils would be a light snack, right? A light snack. Get it? Yeah. Light snack. Come on, that was good. Right? Anyway. Hashtag bad puns. Anyway. So the emphasis in the verses, in the Ungoliant parts of this song, is on her hunger. Right. Especially with that repetition of how I need it, how I need it, how I need it. Right. She's hungry. No matter how much she eats, she always hungers for more. Right. So Ungoliant is about she is about a a hunger which can't be filled, uh, which, of course, that's how we're introduced to her at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. When Morgoth introduces her as the mistress of her own lust. That's a line from the Silmarillion as well. One one thing I'm not sure if it's related at all. I just find it kind of odd is that you'd think there'd be a fourth how I need it because it's really building up but there's but after that there's just the bridge yes um yeah you're right uh it, it's almost like it's almost like she's gonna keep saying that forever and he just and then he just interrupts her right yeah. or, or rather 
Morgoth's perspective interrupts here. Now, the interesting thing to me is that both of them get three... Well, one of the interesting... There are lots of things that are interesting to me. Uh, both of them get three speeches, right? Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three, yeah. Yeah, both of them get three speeches. Morgoth's is longer. Morgoth's is longer, but it's the same every time, right? It just goes back and repeats the same bridge, whereas she gets four different four different verses, mm -hmm. right? Um, so she's saying different things each time, and he just keeps saying exactly the same thing again and again. I think she's trying to, like, persuade him to give them to him. Yes. Especially on that p last part. Exactly. I did my part, now it's your turn, and remember what you've promised. And then he just keeps... He, you know, it, it, it keeps going back to the same thing. Where can I run? Where can I hide the Silmarils? How can I hide? All right. How can I hide? I always thought it was How... where can I hide as well. Yeah. Where can I run? How can I hide the Silmarils? Um, I can listen to it again, but it's not worth it. Um, uh, gems of Tree White, their life belongs to me. And then the, that last line. Oh, it's, and I, by the way, I think the lyrics are incorrect here too. Um, oh, it's sweet. How the darkness. I think it's flowing, not floating. But I'm not sure it matters a whole lot. Uh, no, um, um, this definitely isn't an is. Even if it's extremely slow, that's just... There's, there's no I whatsoever. It's impossible for there to be an is. Well, I think it might be just kind of slurred together there. No, it's like... That would be like the most <laughs> slowed word in the history of anything. Well, in song lyrics, you kind of do that sometimes. That's, that's not uncommon. Um, just like for this... What would I mean to that? Well, be we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. We'll come back to the chorus in a second. Let's talk about the, the, the verses in the bridge first. Um, but it's those last two lines of Morgoth's bridge that I think is so fascinating, right? Because, oh, it's sweet how the darkness is floating around. So he is surrounded with Ungoliant's darkness, right? Ungoliant mm -hmm. uh, surrounds them in a cloak of unlight as they escape from mm -hmm. Valinor, right? Uh, so he's panicking. <clears throat> Where can I run? How can I hide the Silmarils? Mm -hmm. Right? He's claiming them to himself. He wants to keep her from eating them. And then those last two lines are like a, a total change of topic. Right? Mm -hmm. what, what does that have to do with anything? The darkness is from her. The darkness is what is... It is with bands of darkness that she restrains him. In mm -hmm. fact, right? So Ungoliant's darkness, although it has been a shield to him and a, a cloak to, to conceal him from the, from the Valar, from the sight and the pursuit of the Valar, it's a threat to him now. You'd think he would want to escape from her darkness. And yet, in that last line, the uh, Blind Guardian depicts Melkor as admiring the darkness as it, as it flows or floats around them, right? Mm-hmm. Which is really kind of interesting. Because notice how he's kind of on both... Ungoliant is completely single-minded, right? Mm -hmm. She just wants to eat. She wants to take the light and eat the light and spit it out as darkness. Mm -hmm. um, he wants to keep the light, right? He's claiming the life of the Silmarils, and he's wanting to preserve them because he wants to hold on to the light. Um, but yet he also admires the darkness. He admires and enjoys the darkness that she's spinning around them. Right? Mm -hmm. So do you think... I'm not sure about this. Do you think that they are suggesting that he is kind of divided in his mind? Um, that... I'm, I'm not sure how far to go with this. I don't know if you see what I mean. Um, Ungoliant is completely abandoned, right? Mm -hmm. All she thinks about is her hunger, right? Give it to me. I must have it. Um, and of course that first line, give it to me. I must have it. Precious treasure. I deserve it. Could almost be said by either one of them, right? It's clear that it's Ungoliant who's saying that, right? Mm -hmm. But both of them are wanting to have the treasure, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them are wanting to, uh, to like it could really you know, feel be, that they deserve it. I mean, it's clearly a but it really could be either. Yes. Yes. 
Like, and give it to me. Like, give, like, freedom of what I want. Yes. To keep. Exactly. He thinks, Morgoth thinks he has a right to all this stuff. Yeah, and he right? thinks he deserves it. Um, just as he said in the opening sequence, right? Mm -hmm. I had a part in everything, right? He thinks it's owed to him. Mm -hmm. Anything that he wants. He thinks that he can have mastery of any of these things just by naming them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at the beginning of the song, it's a, it's not obvious who's speaking, right? It's not like they label it, right? You know, so like, we... This is Ungoliant <laughs> right, talking. Exactly. This, this doesn't... <laughs> is Melkor talking. We have to interpret that and figure that out, right? Yeah. Um, so it's ambiguous at the beginning. It could be one, it could be the other. Which is, I think, cool, because it shows that they have a similar attitude, right? It could be either one of them. Mm -hmm. So they have something in common, this desire, this uh, 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 this focus on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking of themselves first, thinking of what's owed to them, their desire to have the treasure for themselves. Actually, they have that in common. Oh yeah, and this one is clearly in the land because of the black hat. And yes. this one, I almost thought could be both, but it really can't because... Yes. Um, because I did my part, Melko didn't really have, like, a, part. a major part. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I agree. Um, <clears throat> no, I agree that Blackheart Show Me is the clearest indicator, right? Because yeah. that word Blackheart is directly from the book. That's a quotation from Ungoliant. So it's not explicitly labeled, but that's, yeah. the, you know, that's pretty close to explicitly labeled because yeah. it's straight also, from her dialogue. Why does she say, release me from my pain? Release me from my pain. That's a really interesting line, isn't it? Um, she's in pain because she's hungry. Right. So, but it's, a, but it's a, I mean, even when like you are, as you usually are begging for dinner f half an hour before it's ready, you don't say release me from my pain. Right. Yes. Though you probably will next time. Um, <laughs> right. She, she's asking to be released. So the pain is her hunger. And so she's like, give it to me. And by giving it to her, he's going to release her from her pain for how long? Like two seconds, two seconds, and then she's gonna be hungry again, right? It's like, mm, those are good symbols. Now give me some more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, in other words, she can't really be released from her pain, right? Mm -hmm. As long as she is dedicated to nothing, it shows the sort of the emptiness of Ungoliant situation, right? Mm -hmm. She, if if all you are is focus is 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 hunger and focused on filling yourself, you can't ever be filled, right? Ungoliant is never going to be satisfied. Ungoliant has just had the biggest meal, right, in the history of of of, of Arda, right? Mm -hmm. And she's not full. She's only more hungry. She's even saying, "Release me from my pain by giving me more." But as you say, it's only going to satisfy her for two seconds, and then she's going to yeah. be even more hungry again. Um, so it shows the emptiness, the, the, I mean, it's, it's really horrible, mm -hmm. right? Ungoliant's perspective. How is Melkor's perspective different? What do we see in his words that we don't see? And she's just all about, you know, give it to me. I still hunger for more. Uh, he desires it too. Again, like that first verse could apply to either one of them. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's, um, uh, but there's, like, there, there's some, more than that, right? Some, well, can I run? How can I hide so well? So that shows that, like, in some cases, he is willing to, like, back up and just stop for a second. Yes, exactly. It's 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 like he doesn't. Uh, like he's not completely. Yes. Like he doesn't completely just want to fight. Yes. Yes, and he he. His desire for the Silmarils is different from her desire from the Silmarils, mm -hmm. right? She just wants to feed herself. She just wants to kill them. Yes, exactly. He wants to preserve their life, right? He wants to own their life. He claims it for himself, but and, and that's not to, good. But he still wants to keep them alive. Yes, exactly. He wants to keep them alive. Where can I run? How can I hide the Silmarils? Sounds, well, not quite selfless, right? but much more selfless than ongoing. He's thinking of something besides himself, mm -hmm. right? He's thinking about the Silmarils. Now he's thinking of them for himself. Again, it's not yeah. like he's a good guy, but it does, the, the song does seem to emphasize 
the the difference of Melkor's situation from Ungoliant. That he is not yet where Ungoliant is. And then you're right. We should get to the chorus. So, um, on the lyrics page, it did say, because we've been questioning about this, the one does refer to, um... Well, that's our theory, and it's a theory others share. So, the first question, so, we are following the will of the one through the dark age and into the storm. Let's just start with that. Now, the first question, obviously, is who the heck are we, right? Yeah. Morgoth and Ungoliant have each been using the first person, right? They've been referring to themselves as I through mm -hmm. their verses. So who's we? We are following the will of the one? The one has to be Iluvatar. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't imagine what on earth else in a Silmarillion song the one could be, especially when you're talking about the will of the one. Right? We're following the will of the one. We're following the will of the one through the dark age and into the storm. So who's we and in what sense are we following the will of the one? Yeah, so right? like the theory that we have, although it doesn't make sense with the last line, is that like the chorus is like from like the listeners or the readers' perspective? Yeah, I think that's a really smart way of looking at it. The we can't be Morgoth and Ungoliant, right? I mean, that's the one logical thing, because they're the eyes in the verses, right? So you think, like, maybe we is like Morgoth and Ungoliant come together and sing the chorus together, <laughs> right? And that doesn't work. That doesn't work, yeah. Nope, 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 Clearly not, <laughs> right? So I agree. We. And especially since this is the first song in the album, it would make sense. Not technically. No, okay, not the first track, but it's the first song. There's <laughs> tracks and there's songs. Okay, <laughs> you keep you keep calling me on that. Okay, All so right. let's, let's restart this film action. <laughs> this is the first song, the song. Uh, and so <laughs> the idea that um, we, the listeners, are being um, We're following the will of the one. Are, are being uh, addressed here, right? Um, through the dark age and through into the dark the storm. age and Obviously, into the storm. The Silmarillion um, is and the Lord of the Rings of the Dark Age. Well, the Silmarillion especially. Well, because remember, we started with the end, right? Yeah. And the War of Wrath is when that that the, the if if we consider the the fact I mean, that the, technically the, the war of the wrath is the end of the dark age because right. morgoth goes to prison exactly and the, the so the the, the 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 time scale of the album is morgoth's arrival in middle earth through the war of wrath mm -hmm. right and we get that from the very beginning from from that in that first track but technically the time we get frame, that um of technically the time frame of the whole album is from the wall of wrath to the wall of wrath <laughs> well, right. From the exactly. Wall of Wrath to after the Wall of Wrath. To, to the war, right. Because of um, right. Harvest of Sorrow. And yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. Um, okay. So the Dark Age, therefore, could be Melkor's domination of Beleriand, right? And that seems that seems fairly clear. And into the storm, the storm is the War of Wrath. Yeah. Presumably, right? Well, really, Especially since like, we just got that in the first track. The storm is like the. F Flurry of battles. Right, right. Yeah, I would think so. I would. So, I, so, uh, so, the fact that the title of this song is "Into the Storm" and that it comes right after the "War of Wrath" track at the beginning is to me pretty suggestive, right? Mm -hmm. Because we start at the end chronologically, the end of the story, and then we go through. Uh, uh, you, you know, we 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 go backwards and but we're still kind of looking towards the ending yeah. right we're still looking towards the, so it's 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 into the storm so through the dark age and into the storm definitely suggests to me that we're talking about the listeners the, the listeners are we right the, like the singers yeah. and the listeners we together are going to journey through this story of the silmarillion through the dark age and into the storm right mm -hmm. in which case it would mean that it's us the audience and the singers who are following the will of the one like, yeah. But then the the last line is either incorrect. The last line I or... can't figure at all. Um, I think I would say, well, hang on, let me finish my first thoughts, my my thoughts about those first two lines first. So we are following the will of the one. 
what they're suggesting, therefore, if we're understanding this properly, then they're suggesting that we, you know, the, the, the band and the listeners, as we go through the album, as we're following this story, they're reminding us we're following, this is the will of Iluvatar, right? Mm-hmm. This is the, like, it's tragic and it's sad, but at the very beginning of the Silmarillion, Iluvatar says, nobody can alter the story in my despite, right? Nobody can do something against my will. So the stuff that happens, this is the will of the one, right? This is, this is, this is nevertheless going to be the story that, Ilu- that Iluvatar mm-hmm. wants told. Um, that's how the whole thing is characterized there. So that's how I understand the chorus until the last line. The last line, I'm going to go ahead and say, the last line of the chorus of Into the Storm is the single line in any song on this entire album that I understand least. Yeah. I don't get that line more than I don't get any other line can in they any even song. Can see that line? Yeah, they can see they the line. Can? It should be on screen there, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord, I'm mean. And I'm not sure that's at all right. Again, these lyrics are not official lyrics uh, and they they're wrong in other places. Lyrics. But this is the, the every every lyric sheet I've ever seen uh, on any side. I, I know I searched it you know, many places as I could find it. And they all say that. Um, uh, it sounds like it's two syllables, actually. Right? Uh, Again, it could just be slowed, though. It could be slurred together. Obviously, well... It doesn't make any sense to me. Because I don't know who I is. Who would I be? Melkor? Iluvatar? I don't even know. It's right? clearly not Iluvatar because it's clearly talking not. to Iluvatar. Yes, exactly. It's talking It's talking about and to Iluvatar. So, clearly. So, I don't really even know. Um, let's listen to it again. Um, I mean, I agree, Light of Day, Melkor is indeed mean, right? But that's kind of what leads me to wonder if that's just what the wild guess of the person who is writing out these lyrics, uh, what's, what led them to that wild guess. Perfect. That's the line in question. I think it no, is. I, I Lord, think I mean, it is. Yes, I I think it is. I mean, I can, I could be convinced that that's what that line is saying if they're slurring the thir- the middle syllable. I think they are. But I, I if it is, I don't understand it Me at either. all. I mean, not even I don't even have clue number one about how to begin yeah. thinking about that line and how it fits in with anything else. Yeah, like we just burned a million dollars for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't even know. I mean, it's so uh, I, I, anybody who has who, where? On the chat. Yes. Oh, M-A-M-E-L-K-O-R. I M-E-L-Q-U-O-R. Q U? No, it's not the Q U. Uh, see, this is uh, this is this is what you get when your dad is an audiophile and your first en- encounter with the Silmarillion is in audiobook form. So you don't know how Melkor is spelled. Yes, M E L K O R. I don't know how Arendel is spelled either. Arendel? Yeah. yeah. Is it, does it does it start with an A? E A. E A. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It's two syllables. A Arendel. I thought it was A O N D O. It is. No, no. So then it should start with an A. No, E is pronounced A. Obviously. <laughs> That's not very obvious. <laughs> I know, but it's so true. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it is. E is pronounced A. That's quite common, actually. In what? English. Well, but not modern English. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. In Anglo-Saxon and in Middle English, that that's the, okay. Anyway, uh, so we should. Are you wanting to move on to the next one? Yeah. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, we're running a bit out of time. Oh, uh, we are starting to run out of time. Okay, and so what? So let's transition into the next, um, the next transition piece, which is called Lamoth. Lamoth. Well, Lamoth. Lamoth. 
It's not Lameth. It's Lameth. <laughs> Look, when you read Tolkien words, you have to try not to sound like an American. Lameth. <laughs> Tolkien would never have said that word, Lameth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, um, but anyway, so but to, before we leave into the storm completely, I am I, I solicit from anybody, uh, please make suggestions for what you think, either an interpretation of that line or a better uh, okay, transliteration that, of that. That's line. a good idea. Um, Is that line in the intro to the next verse? Thinking about, I mean, but then it's ungo- it transitions to ungoliant. Yeah. Ungoliant, ungoliant isn't self aware enough to talk about her. She's not going to be like, gosh, I'm kind of mean, aren't I? Right? Like, I, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, that's how you spell it. Yeah, that's how you spell it. A arendo. There. Yeah. Mm. Not how you thought it was spelled. No. No. Yeah. No, not, not surprising. But hang on. Hang on. Hang on. So Lamoth, uh, and everybody remembers what happens at Lamoth, right? What happens at Lamoth? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's more or less it. Yeah. That's a little more dramatic than that. <laughs> when Melkor is ensnared by Ungoliant, he doesn't say. Eh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he shouts a little more dramatically than that, but like- yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, he yawns. That's exactly it. <laughs> anyway, so Leoboth is, of course, the play, the lo- the physical location where uh, the echoes of the great cry of Morgoth are that still goes, heard. Uh, <sighs> he yawns. The echo of the yawn will come. Oh, wow, that's a big yawn. Is that an avalanche? No. Okay, so this track is 28 seconds long. We get one echo of a cry, and then we get about 23 seconds of wind noises. And an avalanche. It's not exactly an avalanche. It's an avalanche. avalanche. Okay, okay, fine. It's an avalanche. (laughs) I'll go with Avalanche. Uh, but, so why do you think? Uh. Well, let's remember, on the one hand, it recalls the geographic, like the physical context, mm-hmm. right? Uh, ongoing, this is happening up at the Helcaraxa, at the, the grinding ice. Remember mm-hmm. I told you it's like really icy and freezing cold, and it's it's like this, uh, oh, yeah, the thing it's like the, a land bridge across yeah, the, the thing ocean. Yeah, Fingolfin had to get through. Exactly. Follow. Right on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fingolfin and his people have to cross it later on. Uh, but on, it's where Ungoliant and Melkor have their little discussion. Their little disagreement, right? The thieves' quarrel, as it is called. Anyhow, and that's where he's rescued. So it's up there in the north at Lamoth, the where the you know where the echoes of his call. So we hear the distant echo of his cry, right? And I I, I, I agree that the echo of the cry that we hear does kind of sound like a yawn, doesn't it? But anyway, it sounds like an extremely big yawn. <laughs> it sounds like the yawn of an elephant. An elephant's yawn. Okay, I, I can get I, I can get behind that. And then and, 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 and then we get the wind, right? It's called mammoth. <laughs> it's not called mammoth. Oh my god! So it's an elephant's yawn, and then it's mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> so you think it's a pun on llama? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that you are silly, but that's no. But that's not news. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so the wind, right? That I think it's. The question is, why does this track go on as long as it does? The echo of the cry we heard within the first 10 seconds. Why do we get the next 18 seconds after that, right? Why do we get that, just the wind sounds? The and sounds the of winds and possibly avalanches uh, after that. One avalanche. <laughs> but, but, um, I think it's to, to, it suggests desolation, right? We hear the wind, uh, you know, and it sounds like, you know, like the Arctic wind over the Helcaraxa, right? 
And so I think that what we're hearing is this sound and, and the fact that we're not just hearing his cry, we're hearing the echo of his cry, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of cool. And an avalanche. <laughs> and an avalanche. But the echo of his cry causes an avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, seriously, that works. That works, right? Like, even the echo of his cry causes destruction. I can get behind that. I, you know, fine. I'll give you your avalanche. I like it. Uh, not your mammoth, but I'll give you your avalanche. <laughs> but I like my mammoth. I think we could possibly have time for Nightfall. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. We can start. We can. We might not finish Nightfall, but we can always. Uh, yeah. We can always come back. We, we can always come back to it. We do have a. We do have a hard stop because again, social calendar. Uh, social calendar. <laughs> he's he's he has an appointment. Uh, but um, not a strict appointment. <laughs> Okay, this is, uh, there's a lot going on here in this song. Which we can't really even cover one verse. Yeah, we can start. We can start it. We'll start it and we'll come back and we'll pick up with this one the the next time. So, uh, this is a, unlike the last one, this is a much more sort of storytelling song. Right. A lot more happens. It, it tell it tells a much longer story in this song. The other one was really just kind of that moment, right, of the conflict between uh, mm-hmm. between Morgoth and Ungoliant. And what it seemed to be trying to capture was not even so much the story, right, as like the perspectives putting uh, sort of showing the desire of Morgoth and the desire un- of Ungoliant and how they're similar and how they're different. Right. That seemed to be the main thing mm-hmm. that Into the Storm was yeah, doing um... here is different. Um, one other, one, um, one verse I already see, that, that I already see what it's about. This is clearly about Feanor. Yeah, we get a lot of Feanor in this, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very cool. The so, words of a banished king. The words of a banished I king. Swear I swear revenge. I anger. And yeah. Anger and also, in the case of Feanor, um, yeah. what was that? Uh, sorry, that's just my calendar. Why do you three things. <laughs> don't, don't Four worry. things. At the don't same worry time. about it. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. You're saying in the Curse of Fanor? Um, in the Curse of Fanor, they do say um, every time in the chorus, they say at least once, I swear revenge. I swear revenge. Yeah, yeah. The the revenge of uh, uh, of Fanor is, uh, is, is something they focus on a lot, right? So let's start at the beginning. No sign of life did flicker. In floods of tears she cried. The references there are pretty clear, right? No sign of life did flicker, so we start with the death of the trees. There's no sign of life in the trees, right? The trees are completely dead. In floods of tears, she cried. This is Nienna, the Vala, who the is the one, the one who, um, the one who made sun and the moon. She helps to make. The, she, she. The she, one who like grew the flower and the. She's the one who weeps, thing? who cries over the over the dead trees. Oh. And they. Who's uh, the and one who did the flower? And Yavanna the makes them sing. Oh. Yavanna, yeah, she, she's the one. Yavanna is the Vala who is in charge of like growing things, basically, right? Living things. So, um, uh, so she's the one who made the who sang the song to make the trees grow in the mm-hmm. first place, and she does uh, make the flower. And the, we just got to the making of the sun and moon mm-hmm. recently in our reading of the Silmarillion. All hopes lost, it can't be undone. That's like when, that's like when Vienna is talking about like they can't make it again right exactly when yavana says that like gone. that which she has done you know that which she has done once she can't do again mm-hmm. right so yes they're wasted and gone uh, all hope is lost all hope is lost in the life of the trees right mm-hmm. okay so the first verse is first verse establishes the destruction of the trees and sets the tone with me tears right mm-hmm. with the weeping and all hope is lost so we have just the tragedy of the death of the trees in the very first verse. Then, save me your speeches, I know I know what you want. You will take it away from me. 
take it and I know for sure the light she once brought in is gone forevermore. Who's talking here? Hold on, can I... Uh... Yeah, I don't want to quiz my son who's only uh, listened to the Silmarillion once. What? what? I think I know. Yeah, um, that's Melkor. Uh, no, close. This, 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 this is this is uh, this is Fanor. Okay. It's Fanor. Because remember, remember what happens after. Uh, remember what happens after the uh, the uh, after the trees are destroyed. They say they could restore the trees if they had a little bit of the light of the trees. And so the other Valar, remember, they're all like, oh, well, man, it's a good thing that Fan... Boy, that was good thinking, Fanor. You saved some of the light of the trees and the Silmarils. That was great. So now, like, you know, he basically saved them, you know, for a rainy day, right? So that now, uh, since Fanor thought to preserve some of the light of the trees, which was very thoughtful of him, now they can unlock the Silmarils, right, and let that light out. And with some of that light, Yavanna could make the trees live again. Mm Mm-hmm. So they're like, so we could we could restore the trees to Valinor if Fanor would just give us the Silmarils. Oh, so is that like Fanor talking to Melkor? It's him talking to the rest of the Valar. Mm. Because they're asking him, would you give us the Silmarils so that we can bring the trees to life again? We'd have to destroy the Silmarils to do it. We have to break them and open them up, right, and take out the light. But that would be used to restore the trees for everyone. Right. So Feanor thinks that, um, that like even if they do take the summer whales and use them, then it won't then it won't work. Well, it's not that he, he thinks that it doesn't work. I think the light she was brought in is gone forevermore. His Silmarils will be gone forevermore. Mm. Right, and that's really kind of that's the most fascinating because, thing about this because verse. Because that's another thing that you can't mention. Exactly. That's exactly what he says. Remember, mm-hmm. he's like he says, "For the lesser as for the greater, there are some things that they can only do once." Right? He says, "You can destroy my gems, but I can't make. I couldn't make another set of Silmarils. And if you destroy the Silmarils, then you will break my heart, and I will mm-hmm. be slain." Um. And so he says, "No, uh, he won't let them." And so, so. In the, in the song, he starts off, save me your speeches, I know what you want. Um, save me your speeches, I know what you want. He doesn't say that in the book. That's not a quotation uh, from, uh, take it away from the book. From take what they're doing here, I think, in the song is sort of putting into Feanor's mouth essentially what he really means, like what he seems to be thinking, right? They're doing an interpretation also, of Feanor like, um, here. Wouldn't, like, we've got to go. Yeah, we do but, have to um, go. Yeah. Um, I think that, like, the one, the light she once brought in is gone forevermore. Um, to get an for sure. um, I think that means, like, he thinks that, like, Mel Paul and the other one will just come back and destroy that. Maybe, maybe, but I think, see... I, I said that's my favorite line from this chorus. The light she once brought in is gone forevermore, um, because it it means it's it's an awesome line because it means two different things at once, right? On the one hand, if he won't give up the Silmarils, then the light is gone forever, right? The light of the trees are gone. The trees are permanently dead. If he refuses to give up the Silmarils, the trees will never be restored. But if he does give up the Silmarils, then the Silmarils also, are gone forever. But yeah. Exactly, right? So the trees will be restored. So everybody else, right? All of the Valar are saying, dude, this is a no-brainer, right? Give up your three gems, and then the trees will be back. It's like the three gems just contain a little piece of the light, right? When you could, hey, we could have all of the trees. So you can have as much light of the trees as you want. You'd have more light than you have in the Silmarils, right? Mm-hmm. It seems to them like an obvious thing, but it's not an obvious thing to Feanor. Right, because Feanor values his own craft. He, he he says that he can't make it again. He says he can't make it again. So, uh, even it, so, to Feanor, right? Feanor is saying that even if the trees are restored, the light is gone forever. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is thinking, "Help us bring back the light and keep the light from being gone forever." But to Feanor, the destruction of the Silmarils and the restoration of the trees would be the destruction of the light. Right. Even though everybody else would get it again. And I love the way that it works. Take it. And I know for sure 
Now, we can read this in two different ways, right? We, we, could, we could read a stop there. Notice it's a, a song lyric, so they don't have much in the way of punctuation, right? Yeah. We could imagine there's a period at the end of that line. Take it and I know for sure. We'll know what? Well, he's implying what he knows. In the book, he says, if you will compel me to give you the Silmarils, he says, then, I, then will I know indeed that you are of Melkor's kin, Right? He's like, you are your 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 Melkor's family. If you if you take the Silmarils from me by force in order to restore the trees, then I'm gonna know for sure that you're related to Melkor. Because you're gonna be acting like him. Right? So that's what that line so that, that that's the clear reference in that line, take it and I know for sure. It's interesting, by the way, that throughout this paragraph it's using the pronoun it to refer to the Silmarils. As if they're singular, right? But anyway, um, so take it and I know for sure. So, oh, oh, you could... Um, or it could or continue it could on. Not have a period and exactly. take it and I know for sure the light sh- it once brought in and gone forever and ever. And that's really cool, right? That's like, so it's like there are two ways, like either... Um, either... Um, either take it and like... If you take it, then, like, well... Then I know for sure you're like Melkor. Then I know for sure you're like Melkor. And then then full stop, right? Then, yeah. Then, then, um, then if you, then if they take it, then, then... The light she once brought in is gone. The light she brought in is gone. Right. So, basically, it's... If it, if he say, if there's a period there, right? Take it and I know for sure, period. The light she once brought in is gone forevermore. He's talking like about the trees. Like, that's just like, okay, that, that's it. Like right. That it's gone. So Referring to the trees, right? Take it and I know, so so no, I'm not going to give you the Silmarils. If you try to take them by force, I will know you're of Melkor's kin. The light is gone, right? The trees are not going to be restored because yeah. I'm not going to give you the Silmarils. But if if we don't have it with the period, take it and I know for sure that the light she once brought in is gone forevermore. Mm-hmm. If you take that is in that case, the light she once brought in is now the light of the Silmarils, mm-hmm. right? So basically, this shows how for Fanor this is a lose lose situation. Everybody else considers it a no brainer, right? Give up these little gems and you can restore the trees. But for him, it's a lose lose situation. Either he keeps the Silmarils and the trees are not restored or they take the Silmarils and the Silmarils are destroyed. And for him, the light is gone forevermore. The light of his Silmarils is gone forevermore. And so both of those meanings, both of those sort of bad outcomes of the situation are contained in that statement. I think it's, I love those lines. I think that, that, that works really, really well. I think this is the best place to stop because we have to go in like two minutes. Agreed. Can I say one more thing? Yes. Okay, okay, one more thing. Not too long. They blinded us all, right? Uh, this is, of course, not part of Feanor's lines. So, it's just like in the background. Yeah, so it's if we, exactly. And this happens a bunch in, uh, in this song. Uh, let's see. Listen. They blinded us all. Who's they? And who's us? I think they is the Valar and us is the elves. Mm. That's what Fanor is going to argue, right? What we're hearing... That makes sense. Yeah, because Fanor is going to give his big speech, right, later on. Not at the same time that they're asking him for the Silmarils, but later on. It makes sense that, um, like, if he was making the speech, it would make sense that like if he was going to say it somewhere even though like it's in the middle of a phrase he could say that exactly exactly in other words what they seem to be doing in the lyrics here is they're taking these two scenes Feanor being asked for the Silmarils by the Valar Mm -hmm. right and then later on him making the speech to the Noldor 
about how the Valar have done them wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? They're taking those two scenes and they're putting them together. They're juxtaposing them. Mm -hmm. So that... And and the fact that that's sung in the background, right? It's not part of the main lyrics. It's not part of... Like, the guy who is singing Feanor's words here... He doesn't sing that. Yeah, it's just all the rest of the songs. Exactly. That. It's like it's it's like this this chorus in the background saying that, and it's and that's like the elves. It is like the elves. It's it's like this is what it's almost like this is what Fanor's thinking, mm-hmm. right? Uh, or what he's imagining telling the rest of the elves. Um, mm-hmm. Save me your speeches. I know what you want. Is what he says while in the background, as it were. Uh, he's thinking speeches, they blinded us they all. Blinded us, yeah. Yes. So he's now thinking the Valar are the enemy, right? The Valar are the bad guys. Mm-hmm. They, I, I, I know what they want. They're going to try and come and take my Silmarils from me. And if they do, I know that they are, they are Melkor's kin, yeah. right? They are Melkor's family. Um, I know what you want. You will take it away from me. Um, okay. A lot there, as we said, we got, so we got through the first two, uh, two uh verses there um we do have to we stop have to, we got through the first three songs and the first two verses of the next song but the first three tracks one one song <laughs> we keep arguing about vocabulary here anyway uh <laughs> so um i uh, we will uh we're, we will we will jump we will pick on, up on this again uh, this uh, this this series on Blind Guardian we intend to go through and talk about the whole album we want to discuss our way through this entire album uh, which I think is a really fascinating uh, project in adaptation of the Silmarillion uh, so we're oh, gonna <laughs> sorry Jesse came in at the very end um, we're gonna um, uh, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna. So we'll, we will, we'll come back and we'll, we'll resume this. I don't know how many sessions it's gonna take us to get all the way through the album. Can't you post this on YouTube? Yeah, we're gonna post this on YouTube. Yeah. Don't worry. See, you'll be able to watch it. Don't worry, Jesse. You, you'll be fine. Um. So, uh, but I can't promise when the next one is gonna be because, again, busy social calendar, uh, and it's hard for me to get on it. So, uh, we'll do it as soon as we can. Uh, but it's, it's, it's likely not to be until sometime around Thanksgiving that we'll be able to do the next episode. Yeah, maybe like, uh, maybe next a weekend. week, and then the next, and then that yeah. weekend. Maybe. So Maybe. like a week from this weekend. Possibly. Possibly. Sunday week is pretty much the earliest we could we can yeah. we can get there. But anyway, we'll see. So uh, uh, pay attention to uh, so the uh, clearly the best thing to do uh, if you don't want to miss out uh, and you want to uh, attend with us live is subscribe to our Twitch channel. If you subscribe to our Twitch channel, you will get an email notification when we begin our session uh, so you can join us live. And of course, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, then you will get the video as soon as it's posted. So, you know, either way uh, will work perfectly well. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we will see you guys as soon as we can. Uh, Like, subscribe, and join the notification squad. (laughs) That's right. Thank you, Matthias. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, And we'll see you again soon. Bye now. Want to say goodbye? Bye.